Hey guys, Dr. Mike Hitchell back for lecture two in introduction to sport and exercise science. I'm gonna be talking about the foundations and the basic subfields, the next step of your RPU journey. So, foundational subjects are level two. The basic subfields are level three. We'll talk about level two first. So what are the foundational subjects? They are three subjects in particular that establish your ability to learn sport and exercise science effectively. What's the analogy here? If you wanted to learn how to make a car and you had no idea what car parts were what, it would be a matter of incredible laboriousness to try to figure out how that works. But if you knew what the car parts did, what their function was, how to recognize them, then somebody could teach you how to make a car step by step. And when they said, hey, give me the radiator, give me the tire, you would know what those objects are referring to. If you, again, another analogy for car building, if you don't know how to use a wrench or how to use a drill, you may have a theoretical understanding of how to build a car, but you'll never be able to do that unless you know these very foundational basics. Only after you know these can we take the next step and say, okay, now that you know this basic stuff that really has a lot of general transfer but won't get you ahead in anything in specific, now you can learn specifically how to make a car or how to make a dresser or how to make a TV. Once you know what the parts are and once you know how to use the tools, that's when you can really begin to learn how to do actual stuff. So the foundational subjects are really to help you be able to learn. Now you can try learning above level two at level three, etc. without knowing the foundational subjects, you're gonna run into a lot of crazy, crazy difficulties, right? There are three foundational subjects. One is the theory of science and that basically allows you to understand the language and the tools of science. So the theory of science literally explains to you how science works, how it comes to understand the world and how the world works, and the meticulous nature by which science both discovers how the body works and how exercise is arranged, and how we are to use our own intellect to figure out what's right, what's wrong, and what to do. If you're not familiar with how scientists think or how science works, a lot of the kinds of conclusions we're going to be drawing are going to make very little sense. So for example, we'll say things like in the advanced courses, courses the, the current balance of the evidence seems to indicate that it's likely that blah. Without a scientific background or knowing the theory of science, you could be saying, okay, 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 all that brainy stuff, but like, what's the answer? Well, one of the first things science teaches is that there is no answer. There are things of more and less likelihood, and we can't ever deal in absolutes. So understanding theory of science will help you in every single course, and it'll especially help you at the top end courses, level five and six, understanding how guarded conclusions are made, how to change your mind with incoming evidence, and all of that stuff. Course number two is movement anatomy. Fundamentally, most of these courses that we have at RPU are about learning how the body works, learning about how the body responds to exercise, how it's a good idea to train, how the body responds to nutrition, etc. Movement anatomy takes the body and shows you what the body is made of, the basic bones and joints and structures and organs, etc. that literally give you the building blocks of what the body is made of. Because if you don't know the building blocks, how the heck are you supposed to figure out how they move in a coordinated fashion in advanced athletic competition and how to manipulate them? So if we say that, you know, the femur has to adduct by a certain amount during this movement, like what the heck is a femur? What is adduct? Well, if you don't know movement anatomy, if you don't know what the stuff that composes the body is, the bones, the joints, etc., the, the skeleton, the muscles, then it's going to be really difficult for you to figure out what the heck is going on. And then you get to a subject like biomechanics, what about injury? Prevention and care of injuries is going to make no sense at all. Even physiology is hard to understand how things work when you don't know the structures involved. You say, well, you know, uh, red blood cells are manufactured in bone marrow. Bone marrow, 
Like, is that in the bones? I, th I think it's in the bones. You take movement anatomy, you're going to know where everything is in the body so that when you understand the body as a whole, now we can take the body and it's our knowledge of it and start to apply it to exercise and sports science. Last course, the third course in foundational subjects is basic physiology. Physiology is how body systems tend to work and change over time. Physiology, there's a, a course above that, after that, called sport and exercise physiology, but that's how the body works in relation to sport and exercise, something that is almost impossible to understand unless you know basic physiology. For example, someone could say, when an individual is sprinting in the 100 meters, they are producing ATP at maximal rates inside the muscle cells of their quadriceps muscles. Right? What the heck is ATP? Uh, where is it produced? In just the cell? Is there a part of the cell that's produced? Where is the, the cell? How, how do cells work to produce this? Luckily, you already took movement anatomy, so you know what the quadriceps are. You know that they're composed uh, of, of various uh, fibers, and the fibers are composed of cells, etc. But but after that, how ATP, you don't even know what that is, and how does that work? Well, that's the kind of statement that is, is sort of given for granted in sport physiology, and it's up to you to know what the basic physiology is, right? It's a, sort of like a race car mechanic saying now, you know, so we're going to modify the fuel injector here to, to get a bigger, you know, uh, sort of activity in the chamber here. You, you don't know what the chambers of the engine are or fuel injector is or how they work. Any modifications to them are just pure nonsense to you. So basic physiology basically tells you how molecules work, how energy systems work at their very basic, how cells work, how transportation to and from and out of the cell works, maybe something about how digestion works, etc. The very, very basics of that physiology, once you know that, then when you start to apply that to sport in the next course, you go, ah, okay, now I see when they say ATP is produced, I know what ATP is. At the very least, I know how molecules are produced in the body, and I know what energy currency is in the body, and that is ATP. And now when that explanation comes as to how that happens, you have all the baseline knowledge. So now if you have taken all three of these foundational subjects, you understand how scientists think. You understand the language of science that we're going to be speaking throughout this entire course. You know the body fundamentally. You know its parts, what parts involved, and you know more or less the very basic how they work at their simplest levels. Now that you know that stuff, after you've taken the foundational subjects, you can go on and expand your knowledge to much more precise Finally, for the first time, sport and actually has all the stuff. Now, mind you, theory of science, movement anatomy, and basic physiology is stuff that every biologist and every doctor has to take as well. It's not just exercise related. It's if you're going to talk about human bodies and you're going to study them, you're going to have to take all these three courses at some point during the process, preferably at the beginning. Here's the thing about these three courses and some of the other courses we offer at level three. There is a huge difference here between a formal, usually university-based, and now for what may be the first time, online-based education, uh, and just reading articles online. And this is the huge difference. A lot of individuals who read articles online will read them and think, okay, so this person says that, you know, um, testosterone is produced, but then if your insulin levels are too high, then testosterone levels go down. Or if your insulin level are, levels are too high, then cortisol uh, is also too high. So too high of insulin levels make too high of cortisol levels. Okay, um, I know those are hormones. I'm not exactly sure what hormones are, but like there's, part, there's things in the body, maybe uh, like messengers or molecules or something. Um, I know that uh, cortisol is like bad, uh, it's stress related. I think insulin is like something to do with carbs or making you fat. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, if they both go up, that's really bad because one makes you fat and the other one makes you fatter or something or stressed out. That's a lot of stuff to figure out. And if you don't know the basic physiology of what hormones are, how they function, if you don't know uh, what their structures are fundamentally from where they start in the body to where they go, what their purpose is, and how they change with relation to each other and over time, which you're going to learn all these basic courses, 
you're just going to have to take a lot of stuff in articles that are written by people who may know what they're talking about or may not know what they're talking about at total face value because you can't ever be skeptical of the deep physiology behind what they're saying. But people who have had these foundational subjects can look at a statement like that and say something very simple. So it says that when insulin levels get really high, your cortisol gets high too. Well, insulin directly counteracts cortisol. The mechanisms that raise cortisol in the body also uh, uh, you know, have no effect on insulin. And usually if insulin is up, cortisol is down. If carbohydrates are taken in and insulin goes up, cortisol is almost always down at the same time. So the mechanisms are almost always antagonistic. They're not synergistic. So if someone tells you, you know, if you have too much insulin in your body over time, your cortisol goes up, that that's fundamentally very difficult to admit. You may not have the specialized education in sport nutrition to figure out, does that really actually happen? But at the very basic level, if you know that those are antagonistic hormones largely, that they don't usually uh, are high at the same time, either one is high or the other, you can start to be really, really skeptical of that article or of that video or uh, of that book that you're reading by somebody who might know their stuff and might not, you don't know, and, and you might take a step back and, and try to get a little bit more background on it. So there's uh, a huge difference there if somebody who has a background education in biology, physiology, movement, anatomy, theory of science, if they read some articles online about training and sport and diet and all that stuff, they tend to be much more skeptical, much more measured, and can refute BS much better than individuals without that education. So if you've taken just these courses at RPU, you're already one step ahead of the breadline to cite Aladdin at all. I'm not sure what year Aladdin mythically existed at some, you know, 1000 AD or something like that, but you're already one step ahead of the breadline, so to speak, in terms of being able to see, okay, does what this person said say violate even some basic science? And sometimes it does, and we'll get to some examples of that uh, a little bit down the line. So... The good news is, yeah, okay, so if you just learn these subjects, you're already well, uh, you know, ahead of the curve. But the best thing about learning these baseline subjects is they're going to power your journey through the basics, right? And those basics will power you through the rest of the field. It's almost like teaching you to read and write at school wasn't much for its own sake. Okay, you can read and write, that's sweet. Uh, I can give you a person who can read and write who doesn't know anything other than that. Uh, nobody has a PhD in reading. Uh, a PhD in writing means there's probably some content in there, not just stuff that you write. You learn to read and write so that you can learn science and math and literature and geography and social history and all that stuff. Those are the core curriculum subjects in an elementary school or a middle school. So these foundational subjects are kind of like at RPU, learning to read and write learning to understand the language of science, learning the very basic background of the body so that you can even get to the basic subjects. These are pre-basics, these are foundations, right? Now, once we get through the foundations, we get to what we call the level three major basic subfields. What they do is they cover the major classes of knowledge in sport and exercise science. All of sport and exercise science, every single topic, derives in part or wholly from one of these courses, period, from one of these subjects. All applied science is built on the discoveries and insights of these major basic subfields, right? Now, if you do not learn the major basic subfields and you try to learn the applied subfields like sport nutrition, for example, without first learning the basic subfields like exercise and sport physiology, like knowing how the body works in exercise and sport context before you learn how to feed the body. Like if you try to figure out how to feed the body, sport nutrition, before learning sport and exercise physiology, how the body works in that sport context, you're going to ask, you're going to find yourself asking pretty much an infinity number of whys right? And being unable to understand or anticipate how the information is going to be unfolding. I'll get to the first point first. So asking yourself a ton of whys. Uh, I'll, I'll get into this every now and again. Uh, 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 some of us who teach this stuff for a living will get into this on social media with individuals, very intelligent, very curious individuals, and will say something like, well, you know, it's a good idea to train with heavy weights, at least sometimes if you want to grow muscle, 
because uh, that activates your fast twitch muscle fibers. And, and they go, okay, or stimulates them. And they go, okay, why? Okay, because fast twitch muscle fibers tend to grow more than slow twitch muscle fibers. And they'll go, huh, why? You go, well, because of the chemical. Well, well geez, uh, how, how, when are we going to meet <laughs> at that I'm going down to the basics and when are we going to meet? And the answer is, if you don't have a basic education, the, the answer is you, you ask why is all the way down. We can say, well, you know, so the uh, various uh, regulator molecules clip onto others in, uh, you know, in basically these molecular cascades, which are ways of transducing information through the cell that make the cell function differently. And they usually start at the nucleus. And they'll say, so why did they start the nucleus? What's the nucleus? And you go, oh, oh boy. Um, all right. It's like trying to explain uh, uh, how a computer works to your grandma. So your grandma asks, what are you doing? You say, oh, you know, uh, grandma, I'm, I'm downloading a, uh, a video to watch later on my flight when I go fly uh, over to California. And, and grandma says, oh, what's a, what's a download? And you're like, oh, <laughs> Well, you have to start speaking in either like three-year-old terms or the information goes from here to there. But if grandma continues to ask why, at some point you just have to send her to like a computer hardware course or theory of computing. If she doesn't know that, it's really, really uphill. That's okay if grandma's asking you the question. And it's totally cool to give a short explanation on Facebook if someone's asking you a sport phys question. But if you actually want to know stuff, if you're the person reading articles, reading books, talking to other coaches, if everything they say leads to just an endless series of whys, that that means you skipped level three. But if you know level three, if you know biomechanics and they say, you know, you really shouldn't squat like that because it puts stress on your knee joint, you go, why? And they go, because the following motion puts a shearing force on your knee, which we know is destructive to that tendinous and cartilaginous uh, structures. And you go, oh yeah, I know biomechanics. Let me see shearing forces, knee design. Yeah, you're right. Holy crap. But you got to meet them on the way up as they come down to talk to you in that language. And if you don't know the basics of what they're talking about, it's an endless series of whys all the way down. And remember, how much are you learning if you ask an endless series of whys all the way down? Not much unless they teach you the whole science. No one's going to teach you that on Facebook. A coach isn't going to teach you that talking to you. You got to learn that stuff yourself to be prepared and ready to learn. Just to make an, another extreme analogy, imagine you showed up to work on a rocket design team to send the new NASA rocket to the moon or something, uh, another moon mission. And uh, they said, okay, now, so your job is to make sure we plug up all these areas with the following composite material to make sure it doesn't rupture on the way up. And you go, so um, why are we using this composite material? Material, And they give you like 10 equations for material science. And you're like, what do those mean? And they're like, what do you mean? Don't, don't you have a material science degree? That's why you're here. And you're like, no, I, I read articles online about rockets. Like, all right. At some point, you got to have that basic knowledge. Otherwise, it's going to be pure nonsense. These are the courses that give you that basic knowledge. So they're incredibly, incredibly important to take first before you move up the rungs. It's tempting to go right into the applied stuff. Some of this stuff is a little bit more boring than others. But I promise it's going to be a huge tool for you for those uh, reasons. Stop asking all the whys to know the stuff to allow you to link up and to be able to understand why or anticipate how the information unfolds. That's a really huge step. If you're learning something completely anew, and we'll say here's this body of knowledge, and it's really, really complicated, it's really difficult to learn that whole structure and just accept things as they are because you have nothing to connect them to. That's like uh, going to an alien planet and getting a tour and the guy's like, okay, that's a Glork, it Zeb's people, and that's a Zora, and it Zulk's people. And you're like, what the, what the hell is what? Huh? And you know, it makes perfect sense to him because he's got other things to connect. He knows a Glork is really kind of like a car and a Zeb is like an electrical socket. But you have no idea about all that stuff. There's nothing to connect to. So if you're learning sport physiology without knowing physiology, without knowing, uh, so uh, let's put it this way, you're learning sport nutrition without knowing sport and exercise physiology, Someone can tell you, well, you know, this is how you're supposed to eat. And you're, you just have to kind of remember that that's how and there's no why. But if you already know sport physiology right here and then you learn sport nutrition, there's a link to that. It all starts to connect. So as you're learning sport nutrition step by step, 
they say, okay, so carbohydrates should be taken in before physical activity because they power physical activity via glycogen. And you know exactly how glycogen works and exactly how it powers physical activity. And now I'm starting to see how that sport nutrition recommendation is completely logical. When you see that something is completely logical and it makes sense with a structure you already have, you learn it at multiple times the rate you're confused very little and you can work at a, at not a quick pace, but work at a good pace. And the depth of your knowledge is massive. It's just going to be more useful knowledge, not just remembering stuff off the top of your head, real true ideas, because you know how the information integrates. And as you go through learning the course, you're going to know how the information unfolds. You're going to go, ooh, ooh, ooh. I bet we're going to learn about fats next because we've already covered proteins, we've already covered carbs. I know the next fuel for exercise is fats because I had sport physiology. Now I wonder if they're going to give us recommendations for nutrition. Sure enough, you flip the page or rather click over the PowerPoint, boom, guidelines on fat intake. You already saw that coming. For those of you who have been to school before, especially high level, you know how much better it feels to know something is coming versus being like, all right, what the hell is this? You flip the page or you go to the next PowerPoint, you're like, hmm. All right, this seems to be here at random. Nothing's random when you know the underlying fields. Everything fits together, kind of like Jenga blocks or something like that, right? Or uh, Lego blocks. So if you have a base, it's really easy to fit stuff on there. It makes the learning process not only more effective, but much more streamlined, much more enjoyable uh, on top of that, right? So just to reiterate, if you don't know the major basic subfields and you want to go to the applied subfields, if you take the applied subfields without the basics, you're going to have to take most of the claims on faith. Like, this following motion is bad for your knees. Okay, uh, noted. Continue on. That's cool, but you might want to learn the basics for, if anything else, to be like, oh, I see why it's bad for the knees. That makes total sense. If you enjoy taking things on faith, you're probably not a huge fan of science anyway and might not have stepped this far in, into RPU. So it's a really good idea if you want a background to solidify your understanding, to make that understanding easier, to take all the major basic subfields. And there are four of them. What are they? Sport and exercise physiology, how the body works in relation to sport and exercise. Sport and exercise psychology, how the body, uh, sorry, how the mind works in relation to sport and exercise. Biomechanics, basically how the anatomy of the body arranges itself, forces, etc. And what's called motor behavior, and that's how the brain and nervous system both tell your body to move and are altered by movement and learn through, through that whole process. So what we're going to take, a, uh, what we're going to do now is take a brief tour through all of these four major basic subfields and talk about what it is they introduce and explain and give you some select major insights of theirs that are cool learning for you to have now. And you'll see explained in great depth why that's the case later when you go into actually learning about these and into their applied derivatives. So sport and exercise physiology introduces and explains, for example, how we derive valuable molecules from food and hydration from fluids. Okay, you eat food, it doesn't look like little tiny molecules, not dust. Right, it's blood apple. How do we derive what we need from that apple covered in sport physiology? How we transform those molecules once we've derived them into energy for activity, right? And how we store and use that energy to power activity or recovery or repair the actual processes that undergo that. Probably important stuff to know if you're going to end up learning something like sport nutrition or how the body tends to recover. Absolutely. And of course, in sport physiology, we learn how all of these major systems adapt to changes. So that we know if the body goes with less food for a while, what kind of changes does it make? What about more food? What kind of changes? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, sport physiology, exercise physiology have been around for a long time. Here are some major insights that they've given us so far. First insight, I'll go into these just a little bit, kind of like a get you excited for the course uh, situation. So first, probably for evolutionary reasons of having very scant food around in most of our ancestral time, digestion and absorption of almost all of the major nutrients is usually very efficient. That automatically tells us at least two things or hints to us that two things are probably true. One, 
not digesting and absorbing stuff is probably pretty rare and it's usually a disease condition and most people don't have to worry about that. So when people say, ooh, you might not be absorbing all those carbs, it's very unlikely. Another thing we can learn is that if people are really good at uh, absorbing and digesting, if we overfeed them, they'll probably absorb and digest that stuff and gain weight as opposed to saying, well, if you overfeed someone, everything just goes through, it doesn't get digested and absorbed and gets crapped out. So for sure, when someone says about an obese person, well, that person doesn't process uh, food very well, they don't digest and absorb food very well, that's literally a nonsensical backward statement because we know most humans process, digest, and absorb food very well, and that person clearly of their size, they must have absorbed quite a bit, right? So now that we know that absorption is not that difficult, we know the reality of the situation. Another quick thing we can get skeptical about just from this basic physiological knowledge is uh, people selling you vitamin and mineral supplements and saying you have to take these or else you're chronically undernourished and bad things will happen. Well, if you eat a complete diet and your body's really good at digesting and absorbing, usually it gets everything it needs from just eating a good healthy diet. And in fact, that turns out to be the case. But when you learn how good our bodies are at digesting and absorbing nutrients from sport physiology, you start to immediately just become a little bit skeptical, not about all vitamins and supplements, but about those people that'll tell you have to have them or else, or else really bad things will happen. Well, our ancestors and, and up until very recent history, and most people in the world, for example, as a matter of fact, most people in Western countries don't take vitamins and supplements. Are they really only sick and dying? No. So clearly that's not the case. And this is the background physiology as to why. Another really cool revelation. Muscles have distinct energy systems for short bursts, for intermediate duration exertions, and for high endurance exertions. There are literally three independent molecular systems for generating that kind of energy for that kind of movement. One of the things that you can clue from there is, okay, if there's three independent systems for energy generation, and we know the body is of only a certain size, if we put a whole lot of one system, if we develop one system and there's just more of it, more molecular machinery to run that system, maybe there's less to run the other systems. And that's completely true. And that's one of the reasons why people who are really good at weightlifting and powerlifting, short explosive bursts have a lot of those molecular systems that are good at that energy system, but the energy system designed for endurance is very small and very weak in those individuals relative to other very high-level individuals who've expanded on those systems. So we don't ever expect an Olympic weightlifter who's at the top of his class to be a competitive marathon runner. Because you know, somebody without a sport phys knowledge could be like, well, so you know, they'll say things like, well, that person's in really good shape automatically, because we know we have at least three energy systems and a bunch more complexity, we know that saying someone's in shape is already a little bit illusory, just a little bit. We could say, well, it would in shape for what? Because the body has different things that it's good at and different distinct systems for different kinds of things. Next, we know from the insights of exercise and sport physiology, and this is more of an exercise one, that getting enough oxygen to working muscles is a major limiting factor in how much aerobic energy they can produce. A lot of times, mitochondria, the organelles inside the cells that produce energy from oxygen, are ready to produce a whole lot more, but the real problem is getting enough oxygen to them. And interesting enough, you also learn in sport phys that most people can breathe in enough oxygen just fine. It's that their blood doesn't carry enough oxygen. So uh, again, skepticism, the training mask. If we don't have a problem getting oxygen into the body, what the heck does a training mask train? Well, if it was something we really struggled with, the training mask could reduce the oxygen maybe somehow, and then we would train that system. But if the real limiting factor is how much blood you're carrying in your oxygen, uh, how much oxygen you're carrying in blood for many people, then maybe we should work on ways to enhance our blood volume uh, and make sure that we have a lot of red blood cells to carry a lot of oxygen. And in fact, that is one of the major endurance adaptations you see with training. And athletes will do what's called blood doping when they'll literally take out their own blood months ahead of the race, put it in a, in a refrigerator, a very special one and then put it back in to get more red blood cells because that improves performance. And you see very few people doing any kind of breathing drills or lung drills or gas mask stuff because that stuff is not attacking a limiting factor system. Another insight, stored carbohydrate in the form of glycogen is a major fuel source for high intensity repeated movements typical of sports. As soon as you learn sport physiology, you realize glycogen is heavily relied upon as a fuel source for repetitive explosive activities, which is like most sports, if not almost all of them. And automatically, what is your opinion on low carb diets? Knowing only that, your opinion should be 
skeptical because how are we getting enough glycogen to make sure that we power the kind of sport performance that we want? Another revelation, last revelation here, a lot of them here as I tried to pepper them in, but it ended up being quite a few. Adaptations to training, how your body changes in response to training, have different time courses depending on the systems adapting. Some of those systems adapt within seconds. Some of those uh, systems adapt within minutes, hours, days, and some even weeks. So for example, if you teach somebody a new technique of how to move, within seconds they can see you doing it, adaptations are made rapidly in their brains, and they can execute monkey see monkey do, kind of like what you did. So technique has a really fast adaptive capacity. People get better within the actual session. Now, have you ever gotten stronger within a session of exercise? No, you actually get weaker. So strength, in the sense of how much force your muscles can put out, takes probably days, sometimes longer, to actually get better. The time course for strength improvement is longer. And what about bone growth? Do you grow bones over the course of a single session? No way. Do you grow them over a week? No way. Your bones take weeks and months even to grow. So if we have certain exercise plans designed for certain enhancements, we have to figure out, okay, these enhancements that we want, how fast do these systems really adapt? What's the time course of adaptation for these? And then we can figure out, first of all, when to expect results or when we know we're not on track, and also how often to train. That might be another really cool insight. That's sport and exercise fizz. Let's move on to sport and exercise psychology, a little bit of a grand tour here as well. So sport and exercise psychology introduces and explains generally how people tend to think about exercise and get motivated for it. So for example, Do people on average like to exercise voluntarily? Well, some people do and some people don't, and you can study about which ones do and don't, and what kind of factors tend to make people really like exercise and want to do it on their own, and what kind of factors tend to make people really not like exercise and have someone have to make them do it on their own or talk them into it or use motivational strategies. It's sport and exercise psychology, so that's the exercise psychology part. The sports psychology part Uh, basically introduced and explains how athletes enhance their performances with unique ways of thinking. Are there special motivational strategies, special calming strategies, special aggression strategies that athletes can use? How can athletes change their way of thinking to enhance their output in sport? Those are the two main questions that sport and exercise psychology starts to explore. Here are some major insights from those fields. In exercise psychology, uh, Willpower is irreplaceable in exercise motivation. Multiple lines of evidence converging that if a person doesn't want to change fundamentally themselves, and if a person isn't willing to put at least some work, their chances of success in an exercise program or in a new diet is incredibly low. So there has to be buy-in. There has to be an internal desire for the best chances. Willpower in that respect is critical. However, Another revelation from exercise psychology, which also extends to diet psychology and things like that, is that willpower is really good in the short term, but it can't take you into a sustainable exercise or sustainable diet approach because willpower is very mentally taxing to exert, right? Willpower means, let's do it. I got to do this. How often can you repeat that, especially in a free society in which you don't have to exercise or eat, right? and still have time or energy left for anything else. Can you imagine all of your day being all the time? You get exhausted both physically and psychologically. So the reality is that only habits can sustain exercise training or can sustain a long-term diet. Anything that's going to take you weeks and months to complete, willpower is a good start to that, but only formed habits internal repetitive desires to do things will take you all the rest of the way. So if you have a habit of exercise, you just show up and train because that's what you usually do. And a lot of you that are watching this already train quite a bit and exercise quite a bit. And you've had like this kind of strange question. It's not, it's not a strange question on paper. It's just strange when people ask you this question. They go, or, or they say, they say they make a comment and kind of wait for your response. They say, oh man, you know, I've seen you in the gym. You, you're looking really good. You, you must be in here all the time, huh? And you're like, yeah, I guess I'm in here a lot. And they're like, man, that's awesome. Good for you. That's, you've got a lot of willpower. And you're like, Hmm. You know, you usually say, oh, thanks. Yeah. Or, oh, it's no big deal. Thanks so much. But then you think about it like, is there 
really take me a lot of willpower to be in here. I like training. Sometimes I don't like it, like it, but like that's just what I do every Tuesday, Thursday, Monday, uh, Saturday. That that that's what I do. I mean, that's just a kind of a, you know. Uh, can you imagine somebody like uh, uh, after you come out of the bathroom having brushed your teeth? They're like, you brushed your teeth again, didn't you? And you're like, I sure did. And they're like, what? How much willpower that takes to do it every day? And you're like, yeah, right. I've been doing it so long, it's just automatic at this point. It's not emotionally costly. It doesn't require me to grit my teeth. Well, literally, because you have to get the back of the teeth. Uh, but uh, it, essentially. If you want to exert a ton of willpower, you have to to start a situation, to start a change in psychology. But as you want to continue that change, habits are where it's at. So if you're working out and someone says, hey, you got a lot of willpower, you say, you know what? Some days I need it. But most days, it's just a habit and it's something I enjoy. And as soon as that individual that asked you that or told you that develops their own habit, they'll know exactly what you're talking about. In sports psychology, real big insight is that believing you can win, believing in yourself that you are capable of victory in that moment or in that hour of sport performance literally frees up more mental and physical resources so that you can take your best chance at winning. If you believe you can win, you move, you move more smoothly. You are more athletic. You doubt yourself less, which means you don't do a whole lot of this. You go to where you're supposed to go, move the ball where it's supposed to be moved, move the barbell where it's supposed to be moved, move your opponent where they're supposed to be moved with confidence. And that confidence allows you to execute the technique you're supposed to. But when you're not confident, when you don't believe that you can win, the very act, the very mental process of second guessing takes resources away from your brain's calculation of where to optimally move and takes them away from that. And then all of a sudden, your brain isn't as good at being an athlete, at telling you where to move. You got to believe that you're going to be able to do this, whatever it is, in sport, if you fully believe it, are you going to succeed? The, the stupid slogans, believe to achieve, nonsense. You may very well believe that you're going to be able to do it and fail just the same. But the only thing you have control over is giving yourself as good of a chance as possible. And if you believe that you can do something, you're going to put all of your mental and physical energy towards it in sport and have the highest probability that you're going to succeed. So if you're a wrestler and you try to throw someone and you don't believe it's going to happen, you're not going to use the most force you could because your brain sort of thinks, why the heck would I use the most force if this isn't even going to happen? I know that's probably not going to happen. The wrestler is not going to get thrown. I'll need to save my energy to when he tries to throw me back. Okay. But if you believe in yourself and think, I can throw this person, you use your best athletic techniques, you actually succeed in throwing them. And then voila, you're in a different situation, a much better situation, you're on top of them winning the match, right? And if you fail at throwing them, well, then if you don't doubt that they can't throw you, if you believe that you're unthrowable, you immediately make adjustments to defend against their next throw. So a huge thing in sport performance is confidence. It's very hard to engineer in athletes. More on that later when we get to actually talking about sports psychology as its own course. Another last insight here, I believe, yep, last insight from sports psychology is if you're an aspiring great athlete, there are many psychological traits that are going to help you along your journey, enhancing your probability of success to be as great as you can be. One of them is the ability to stay minimally phased under pressure. Individuals that are capable of unbelievable movements that can jump higher, run faster, be more athletic, get to the ball, play sport better than others, I mean, they're the meat and potatoes of greats. They're, some of those people are going to be great. But some of those people, they're really good in practice. And they're really good maybe at local small tournaments and competitions. But when the pressure is on, when the other opponent is also very good, when the other team is also very good, when there's a lot of people watching, when the game is for money, for a lot of money, when it's for fame, when it's for glory, that adds to the pressure. Athletes that end up being great notice the pressure or not. 
they don't really let it affect them much from a variety of tools that we can talk about later in sports psychology in particular. But athletes that let the pressure get to them, let them the pressure shut them down, let the pressure give them second thoughts, going back to that first point of not believing you can win, those athletes will almost certainly never be great. Because as they get to that cusp of greatness, what is guaranteed is going to happen on your way to greatness, you'll run into really good competitors. And if you're nervous in those situations, if you don't handle pressure very well, they're going to win and you're not because they're pretty much almost as good as you or close or even a little bit better, but they're not phased under pressure. You guys normally perform like this. They're good under pressure. You're bad under pressure. And you got this split. You're not going to beat them. You're going to be in high pressure scenarios if you're going to win. So it doesn't matter how many free throws you can hit in your own garage, you know, uh, you know, outside of your garage on your 10 foot rim. If you can hit the best of the best and then you get to an actual free throw competition, even in your local, you know, city center for like the 4th of July or something, you're hitting free throws and all of a sudden you're missing half of them because people are watching for the first time. You got a real big problem and your chance of being a great free throw shooter in basketball or anything related to that are very, very low. So super cool insights from sport and exercise psychology moving along really quick to biomechanics. Biomechanics introduce and explains a couple of different things. First of all, how the different body segments like your lower leg, your upper leg, your torso, your upper arm, etc. are moved by muscles in relation to each other. Really important to know that right? There, there has been uh, some instances where perhaps uh, some individuals that were not quite familiar with that uh, got pretty duped into believing some things that weren't true about fundamental exercise. Just uh, a couple of years ago, there was a really big debate uh, as to how much your lats are involved in bench pressing versus how much your pecs are involved in bench pressing. Well, basic biomechanics tells you that your pecs pull the upper arm this way, thus creating most of the force for bench pressing, your lats actually pull the upper arm back the other way. They're involved in bent rows and rows of other kinds. So people would say things like, well, you know, lats are the prime movers for the bench press. But there's like no way that can be true, right? And if you know biomechanics, you know that's a really good start. So it's a really good idea before you learn any kind of movement, how sports work, what's a good tactic and strategy, what the component parts are and how they're moved around with respect to each other. In addition to that, we wanna know how the body exerts forces and receives forces to the ground, for example, in running and jumping or in falling during a throw or something the water during swimming, the air during cycle riding, right? Nobody rides at the Tour de France. Nobody rides like a beach cruiser style when they're up like this. Everyone's tucked down because we know the relationship of drag and things like that. And for other objects like uh, various sport balls and e other individuals as well. So if you know biomechanics and you know the interactions of forces and, uh, and things like that, now you're in a really good position to start to understand a whole lot more about sport and exercise training than if you hadn't known those to begin with. And here are some major insights from biomechanics. First one, just human walking gait. The process by which you walk is incredibly complicated. Machines are just now catching up in trying to replicate what human gait looks like. Why is this pertinent? Well, somebody could look at your walking gait, maybe a physical therapist who maybe isn't the best physical therapist around or someone, a personal trainer pretending to be a physical therapist, looks at how you walk and looks at how your hips swing and said, ah, you know what, you need more quad work, right? Human gait is so incredibly complicated that in order to analyze and prescribe solutions to gait correction, you need a multifactorial model. You need very likely somebody to walk on a force plate. And these kinds of centers do exist for people with real gait disorders. It's not open and shut. So if you look at walking gait, you go, well, it's easy, one leg after the other. It is not that easy. There's a ton of hip shifting. The, the pattern's actually super complicated. All kinds of different muscles turn on and turn off at various different times. If you study biomechanics, you know human gait is complicated, and someone tells you, you know what, I've seen the way you walk. It's clearly, it's a, you got not enough quad strength. You need more quads. You got to immediately get skeptical of that because it's way too fast of a conclusion in most cases, knowing that it's such a complex problem, right? Here's another cool revelation. This one is uh, something I remember learning when I was younger, and it baffled me because it kind of, I wouldn't say it violates common sense, but it's kind of a surprise. So it turns out that hip extensors, uh, the glutes and the hamstrings, and the knee extensors, primarily the quads, 
are more important in short distance sprinting speed than the calves. The calves actually generate very minimal force. What the calves do in very fast sprinters is they're made mostly of tendon, and that tendon is very tight and it gives a lot of reflex rebound, kind of like a spring, where the glutes and the quads and the hams provide most of the muscle power to move you. The lower limb, the calves, are really just used as springs. So if you have a large calf musculature, you have to drag those big calves around, slowing you down. And because that large muscle doesn't really produce a whole lot of force, especially because it's not given enough time to really contract through a full range of motion, then we know that big calves aren't going to make you any better at sprinting, almost certainly. When we look at the highest level sprinters, it makes immediate sense. And also, what's another instant application or potential application of this biomechanical knowledge? Well, if we know your calves have very little to do with making you faster and you want a, to design a strength and conditioning program for sprinters, are you going to have them do hypertrophy work for their calves? We're certainly going to have them do it for their glutes, hams, and quads so they can have big, big muscles to make strong, to make powerful, to make fast and really make you fast on the track. What about calves? They're on the leg. The leg is, someone could say, well, look, clearly the runners are using their legs, but if you know biomechanics, you know that they're not really using the active contraction of their calves through a full range of motion. So it turns out that if you have a sprinter with really big calves and they said, hey, coach, listen, I took this scholarship seriously. I've been training my calves all summer so I could be a faster sprinter. You can say, all right, Rob, let's back away from the calf training. We're going to have you do squats. We're going to have you do cleans and, and all this other stuff that's actually going to help you. And uh, that's going to be much better off than training your calves because we know from biomechanics, based on a variety of models and studies, the calves don't really have a lot to do with producing a lot of forces for your sprinting. They're mostly function as springs. Last point that biomechanics uh, kind of gives birth to is that your body shape genetically, things you can't change, like for example, the distance between your shoulders, the actual uh, intracromial width, right? We're talking about bones. You can't really widen your shoulders with bones. Oh, sure, you can add muscle, but you can't add bone. That's kind of insane. I mean, you make your bones thicker, but not longer, right? The width of your hips, the width of your bones, the length of your arms, the length of your legs, etc. cetera, uh, within very narrow boundaries are required for sport greatness at particular sports. So it turns out that most greats at sports look very similar to one another. If you look at the 100-meter start line at the Olympics for the 100-meter sprint, almost all those individuals look incredibly similar to each other. Almost all of them have relatively short torsos, relatively long legs, very small calves. Note, right? Makes sense. And that same thing is seen in swimming. It's a different body type in swimming. It's a long torso, long arms, big hands shorter legs, kind of like a human seal or something like that. So what ends up happening is if you want to be great, great, great at a certain sport, you may want to take a look at what your own genetic body design is and see if you align for that, right? In powerlifting, there's a body design that makes you great. In weightlifting, in every single sport, there's not a ton of diversity unless the positions play very different roles on a team. There's not a ton of diversity. So if you want to be the very best, or if you're a coach who's recruiting athletes to be the very best, especially if you have a large role in developing them, you might want to know biomechanics and know which athletes are going to really probably have a good chance of succeeding in a certain sport and which athletes are not just based on genetic body shape. Now, it's not the only variable, but it's a really big one. Lastly, we have motor behavior. So motor behavior is composed of three parts. Motor control which is how does the brain communicate with the body to tell it to move, to tell it to do this kind of stuff. Literally, motor control is almost studying the brain like a computer and the body like a series of uh, servo mechanisms and uh, figuring out how does the computer speak to that device, to that machine, and make it move. That's what motor control is all about. Just by itself, a really, really basic science, but can teach us a lot we're going to learn about in just a sec what those major insights are. Motor development is, remember, this machine that is the body is not built, it is developed, it is grown. Motor development focuses on how those motor control systems basically become uh, operational and how they change over the course of uh, from birth all the way up through toddlerhood, childhood, 
teenage years, maturation, old age, etc. Right? And motor development has a lot of insights we'll talk about in just a bit, but it, it bas basically describes how that motor system uh, begins to function and changes in its function throughout the lifespan of a human being. Motor learning, the last component of that, is okay, we know we have this motor control system, we know it changes over time, but we also know it can be taught to do various different things. Nobody is born knowing how to hit a perfect free throw. As a matter of fact, if you've ever seen individuals who genetically are super tall and uh, maybe are from a different country in which they don't play a lot of basketball, they got great proportions, you're like, oh, I bet that guy's gonna be great. You throw him the ball, he doesn't know how to catch a ball and playing ball sports, right? And you go, what? You don't know how to catch, everyone knows how to catch a ball. Well, no, you have to learn that kind of stuff. Motor learning focuses on how skilled movements are acquired and talks a lot about the optimal conditions for teaching skilled movements. So if you want to teach someone how to execute gymnastics in the best way possible to make them the best they can be, you should probably know some motor learning stuff. If you've got personal training clients that just aren't getting the movements properly and you're frustrated with teaching them how to squat, they just keep screwing it up, motor learning science can tell you, okay, how do you teach individuals in the proper sequence to make sure you give the best chance for them succeeding? Some insights from motor behavior. So first, from motor control, the brain unconsciously, without your conscious awareness, controls thousands of muscles for nearly perfect simple movements that you take completely for granted. So that if someone, uh, God forbid, gets their arm or their hand severed, you say, oh, no problem. We'll, uh, you know, we've got machines are cool. They can develop a hand for you. The actual signals of communication, how much information is going from the rest of your nervous system to your hand or to the muscles that power your hand that are in your wrist is incredibly high. And they're only now beginning to have computers powerful enough to process that and algorithms powerful enough to understand and be able to replicate those movements. So for example, if you reach over and lift a glass of water and take it and put it down to drink, if a scientist had to tell you exactly how many force vector calculations your brain basically had to make to do that, it's in the thousands and thousands. You think, what, what? picking up a glass of water? So you can imagine how complicated shooting a basketball is or going for, uh, you know, just moving your body in the water during a swim. Incredibly complicated, not to be taken for granted, very difficult to correct, if something is wrong. Second insight, there are sensitive periods of learning fundamental sports skills that are likely to be a reality. So if you learn sports skills either much earlier or much later than those sensitive periods, you end up not learning them as well as you could have. For example, if you say to someone, okay, we are going to try to teach you how to be the best possible gymnast but you start training them jazz gymnastics at age 16, there are some maneuvers that are going to be very difficult to learn because even if that person is gifted at learning, their brain no longer works the same from motor development perspective. They no longer are capable of absorbing the same kind of insight. Their brains aren't as malleable to learning really deep movements, really complicated movements, really uh, movements you don't do in everyday life, like somersaults or something, that if you teach that to an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old instead, they'll pick it up five times faster and at a deeper level when they get into sport competition and the pressure is on, they're much less likely to screw up. So if you want good athletes, you gotta catch them early, but not too early. Motor development and these sensitive periods of learning tell us that there's some su such a thing as training people too early. So for example, if you have an exceedingly complicated game from a movement perspective, let's use gymnastics again. If you teach three or four year old gymnastics, it's almost completely pointless. They don't have the neural architecture or the ability to move to even replicate those moves. Three or four year olds, you know, just mastered walking and running around you're going to start teaching them how to do flips and really complicated cartwheels and stuff. They're just going to suck at them. And the problem is they're going to learn how to suck at them. And that's what they're going to learn. And that's what they're going to do. 
So a lot of really good gymnastics training is when you get children that are relatively young, three or four or five years old, you just teach them real basic stuff like how to run well, how to jump well, maybe a couple of really simple gymnastics moves as their brains mature and are ready. Now, ideally, would we love to teach them all of gymnastics early so they could start? Of course, right? We just get that far ahead, but you can't because they're just not ready for that level of complexity. When they're six, seven, eight, nine years old, now you start to thread in more complexity as their brains develop to be ready to handle for it. So if you're interested in coaching young populations, uh, children, teens, etc., know your sport and find out what the sensitive time zones of development are, and there's plenty of publication on this, at least very good guesses, to make sure that you're training people in the right way, not training them too soon with stuff that's too complicated, or waiting too long and missing out on really good fertile ground. Lastly, if you want to teach someone how to do a new technique that you actually want them to apply in sport competition, in the real world, teaching them at first in a slow and controlled isolation from everything else is a really good idea before you take that technique into the live setting. What does that mean? That means at first our nervous systems really like to learn a technique pretty much by itself. So if you teach someone a throw in judo, you're going to teach how to slide one arm in, how to slide this arm over, how to step, how to tilt, how to throw. You might even split that up in different components. And you're going to do that to an opponent that's not resisting at all. And you're going to drill, drill, drill for days and weeks. Never going live, okay, never getting into a judo competition, never trying it on someone who's resisting. Once your body has mastered or has gotten very proficient at that movement without resistance, if we started resistance too early, basically as soon as you try to learn the move, someone would resist. You're not good enough yet to use the move. Now you're just learning how to pull against something that's not cooperating and you're not going to be learning at all. You're not getting a chance to practice the actual move. The move's getting stopped halfway through. Once you learn how to practice the actual move in a very safe, very isolated, very mechanical setting, doesn't look anything in live competition and live judo competitions, people don't just come up to you and go, okay, throw me, great, that's five points, you win, right? They're resisting and all that stuff and they're trying to throw you. Once you know that move in isolation, then you take it through a series of steps in which you expose that move to more resistance, more speed. But because you have that groundwork in isolation, your ability to execute that move in a live setting when it comes down to it is going to be way better than if you learn that move in a rush and just throw it right in to the mix in your own training. And when you're training with people and actually doing what's called randori, which is you stand up in judo and actually try to throw each other more or less at full power, if you just take someone, hey, here's this move, you kind of just show it to them, they're like, okay, great, now try it on your opponent in randori in competition, they're going to learn it very poorly, if at all. So back to that client, you have trouble with squatting. If you're trying to teach the client the entire squat motion at the same time, maybe you should break it up into parts and just drill those components for a while on their own. Have them get used to going like this and just generating a block, keeping their chest up, keeping their abs tight, keeping their back arch, shoulders back. Just have them practice this for a little bit. Then just have them practice tilting their hips back as if to sit down. Then have them practice just sitting at the bottom of the squat and what that means and getting their heels on the ground. And then you can combine those movements later, slowly and surely, into a full squat and then all of a sudden they're squatting really well. And for even more complex movements, that stuff is indispensable. So those are the insights from motor behavior. That was kind of a little bit of a grand tour of all the four fundamental, the four basic courses that you got to do. If you get through those and when you get through those, and those are all courses that you can take at RPU, you're already uh, at an advantage, but you're not at an overwhelming advantage. Here's the deal. You can know the basic subfields, all that stuff I just described really well, each one of them, right? Or even know very, one uh, very well and uh, still not know how to diet or train your way out of a plastic bag, right? Come up to a biomechanist who studies gait patterns at one of America's leading universities, a 50-year-old man who's 500 publications and all kinds of journals. He says, hey, uh, teach me how to squat. Well, that person doesn't know anything about squatting. They know about walking. They've spent their entire life learning about walking. And squat, you know, he might even just give you advice. Again, like, yeah, squat down and, yeah, keep your chest up or something, right? But because there's no applied knowledge there, the applied knowledge is very limited, you might not be able to train or, 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 or design diets for anything. A, a sport physiologist uh, who knows just the basic physiology can teach it might not know much about dieting whatsoever. He would, he would say, hey, is it a good idea to do a low-carb diet? He'd say, you know, 
probably not, but I'm not sure if he's charitable and if he's not, if he's overconfident and say, oh no, it's a terrible idea or it's a really good idea. And he may be very, very wrong. But after learning these basic subfields, you'll have an understanding, uh, enough understanding to learn the applied fields that these fields inform very well. So once you have the basics covered, when you go into the applied fields, you're gonna learn a lot better, you're gonna learn a lot more, and you're gonna be able to now apply what you learn because they're applied fields 50 times better than you otherwise would if you didn't know the basics, right? However, that being said, so these fields don't prepare you for a whole lot except for more learning, but they will already give you uh, an understanding of the limits and tendencies of the human body in general. Right, And individuals who know just the basics are much less apt to be tricked by uh, exercise and diet scammers, for example. So someone says to you, hey, here's this new diet. You know, uh, Calories don't matter, so you can eat whatever you want as long as you avoid certain foods. Calories don't matter. Now, if you know sport physiology, you don't have to know sport nutrition. If you know sport physiology, you know that excess calories are stored as fat, basically as a rule. Oh, man, calories don't matter? boy, I don't think I'm going to buy that. And sport physiologists very rarely succumb. They may not be, not be able to write their own great diet, but if they see a bunch of diets compared and say, which one do you want to pick? They can spot BS pretty well. Uh, here's another claim. Five minutes of exercise a day gets you in shape. Now, if you are if you know sport physiology, uh, you may know uh, that there's a dose-response relationship to exercise, that beginners get a lot out of very little exercise, but as you're more advanced, you tend to need more and more. And you say, well, geez, you know, that five minutes a day might work a little bit for a beginner, but I'm under the impression that that's not going to work for very long. So already, if you know the basics, you're much more secure in individuals not scamming you. Already a very good start, much better if you go on to the applied fields. So the applied subfields, that's what we're going to chat about next. See you for lecture three.